Hi, I'm Susan, and welcome to Susan Stanley Stitch in Time Stitched Stories number four, where we look at Mary's life in St. Louis in 1840 and the material culture that was going on around her as she was learning to stitch her first doll quilt. Gather your stitching. I've got mine. I might not get much done because I do have my notes here. I have a lot to talk to you about today. I think you'll enjoy this episode. It's a kind of a little break from sewing related items and I find it very interesting. I invite your questions. I invite you to share information. I know a lot of you watching live in this area, grew up in this St. Louis area and have probably way more information than I have to share here today. I would love to hear from you and I'd love to know what you know and some of your experiences. Please refer to the tutorials for detailed instructions on how to put your doll quilt together, your patchwork quilt together. This is a Stitch Stories episode where we're just talking about the surrounding world in that time, not the process of making the quilt. Um, I've had a two-part question from the Curious Crafters. Uh, they are participating in this project. I'm so thrilled. One of it I'm going to save for, part of it I'm going to save for later in the episode, but the question I want to address now is why do I wax my thread after I put it, I thread it through the needle? And this is just personal preference. I do recommend that you use your waxer and you, and you wax your, your thread. I like to thread my needle and then once the thread is in the needle, the thread is firm. I can hold on to the eye and it's firmly in the needle and I can pull it through the wax and then I can pull down the thread and get any excess wax off the thread. And I've got that securely held in my finger. I try to keep wax out of the eye of the needle. And so if I was to thread the, if I was to wax the thread before I threaded the needle, I might get that eye gunked up and then, and then future times when I'm trying to thread the needle, that wax is in the eye of the needle and it just, makes it even more difficult. Threading the needle is not always, you know, depending on the glasses and the situation, it's not always the easiest. So that's just my personal preference and that's why I do it that way. But you are, uh, of course, welcome to do it in any way that works for you. Um, all right, so today's episode, as like I said, is gonna be a little bit different. I hope you have your stitching and something, a nice beverage to to relax and let's just enjoy the slow process of handwork while I share with you a little bit about what was going on around Mary in 1840 in her life in St. Louis. In previous episodes, we've looked at how Mary would have accessed the fabric for her little doll quilt and the way in which Mary would have been educated We've looked at the occupations of seamstress and milliner because I've crafted her mother to be a seamstress and her grandmother to be a milliner and they all live with her father in St. Louis. Today we're going to take a look at another very important character during this time in that area and that is the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River is not uh, a living, breathing person, but it is very much alive and it was very much a part of what was going on in this area in 1840. Now, when I, when I decided to talk about the Mississippi River, all I could think of was being a child on the playground and spelling Mississippi with, with my friends or jumping rope and saying one Mississippi, two Mississippi. There's so much culturally that I grew up with and I grew up on the west side of the country, um, about the Mississippi. Uh, it just seems like it comes out in songs. I heard Andy Williams crooning Moon River as a child. Uh, I read The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and their escape down the river, Raft to Freedom. Those books, I really think, I wish I, ha I wish I would take the time, I would like to take the time and reread them because 
they really detailed life on the river and they showed the archaeology of the river and these were Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain's writings from his childhood experiences. He was really telling his own story in so many ways through those books and he was recounting them. Now, let's see, he wrote those as a young, as an as an older man, but they were about his childhood. So they were about early life on the river in that, in that settlement time. Um, so from 1810 to 1860, society had really sprouted and grown around the, that body of water. And of course, you know, any, you look any major area that has a lot of industry and a lot, a huge city and a lot of development, you know, Water is necessary for so many things, and so societies grew up around bodies of water, and so it's no different than uh, no, this, you know, no different than with the Mississippi. And I did find out that Mark Twain's um, pseudonym was from the call of the Mississippi boatmen, and so they would they would yell out Mark Twain, which meant the water was two fathoms deep. <clears throat> I thought that was interesting. I, I hadn't known that before. I, I, I probably had heard that, but that was brought back to life, and I thought that was really interesting. Now, I've been, I've been, I'm just going to talk a minute about, I've been working on these patches, and I'm still making more. I'm probably going to have a couple of, enough patches to either expand a second doll quilt or make make a few doll quilts. You know, the Mississippi during that time was, was really known as the wonder of the new world. It was the American Nile, who was called. And during this time, it was the western boundary of the United States. It had been... Uh, you know, the United States had really built up on the East Coast up, and up to the Mississippi, but not much had happened beyond uh, as far as uh, European settlement and development. And the mighty Mississippi had been a source of struggle for control between Spain and the United States up until this time. And there was a fascination ever since the 1700s with this big, huge body of water. And I think I have seen patches of the Mississippi. I don't live along the Mississippi. Perhaps some of you do. I think after reading a few books that I will share with you at the end of this, I have a new appreciation for the expanse of that water and uh, the power of that water. And I did live in Arizona and there were monsoonal rains and flash floods and I saw the power of water and the destruction it could cause and I think it was no different with the Mississippi. It's probably no different with any body of water. So in the 1700s it was a major tourist attraction and it was called the Father of Waters. It was immense and sprawling and it dominated the landscape and it was it kind of controlled life for people who lived there and like I said by the 1840s the eastern side of the American continent was settled and the Mississippi served as this natural boundary line between that and the great American prairie or as some people call it great American desert for some people who came from Europe and other countries or new settlers, traveling the Mississippi was like traveling the edge of the world. Um, you know, the Gateway Arch, I've been privileged to be able to go there in St. Louis. The Gateway Arch symbolizes the opening to the West, and it was the, the beginning point of the westward movement when people were moving west. And the Mississippi is really a landmark for identifying so many other locations. We always, we talk about, you know, 
the mountains west of the Mississippi or the city east of the Mississippi or up into the Mississippi. So it's, it is kind of amazing how culturally this big body of water has become known. And I did find it interesting to note that the FCC also uses the Mississippi as a dividing line for broadcast call signals. West, or W, is put in front of the call signal identifying broadcast east of the Mississippi, and K is before the call signal identifying uh, broadcasts west of the Mississippi. So this big, huge body of water has uh, been significant in so many ways, and it was no different during Mary's time for her and her family and those people living in St. Louis and, and traveling along in their life, on that, in their journey. Uh, it was such an important part of, of their life. Now, during, during this time as well, the River Valley was being converted from forest to settlement, and it was, it was happening at just an alarming rate. It was just furiously being um, built up. And this Mississippi was uh, clearing the foundation for towns and a safe, it was a safe border for boat travel. Uh, they were clearing forests along the edge of the river, which led to problems that I'll talk about later. But up until the 1830s, the forests in that area had been pretty undisturbed and they contained huge fossils that had been untouched for hundreds of years. And I can't imagine the magic of that, coming upon a massive fossil buried in the forest somewhere along a river bank. The Mississippi was the lifeblood of St. Louis. It was what fed everything that happened in St. Louis and every other levee town that it passed through. The mighty Mississippi during Mary's time had over 100,000 natural, distinct, and individually named brooks, creeks, rivulets, and rivers, and they all emptied into its current. Not so many of them exist today. They are artificially and regulated and created but not so in 1840. It was unregulated, it was, un, it was untamed, and it was wild. Now, industry in, uh, in that area was, was very interesting. And the Mississippi, even today, is one of the busiest industrial corridors in the world. And that was also true in 1840. These rivers were the main highway system. There was no air, there was no flight. There weren't vehicles. I mean, transportation was very different and river travel was uh, powerful and things could be done quickly and relatively quickly and efficiently on the river. So boats coming up from the lower valley were eagerly awaited because they brought essential supplies to these levee towns like St. Louis. Things also came in from the east, but river transportation was a primary source. And travel up the river was labor intensive. Let me tell you, I was reading about this just imagining how exhausting it must have been to drag these rafts up with poles and go against the current. When a new shipment would come in, and we sort of talked about this in the first episode, because this would be true of fabric, this would be true of ribbons, trims, any sewing supply. You can imagine these shipments would come in, the whole town would come out to greet them. The whole town would pitch in to help unload and Items included things like necessities like salt and coffee and cured pork, 
beef jerky, tubs of rice, axle grease, all the things you would need for survival in a small town at that time. And if the boat arrived at night, it was met by torch carrying town folks. They would help unload and within an hour they would be done. And tarps would be covered, tarps would be set over the items that were going to go up the river the next day for the additional supplies headed north. And locals, local bands would stay up all night to guard the cargo. People wanted to make sure they kept, the boats kept coming with these supplies. They were protecting those people importing the necessities. So if there was a ruckus out there and there was somebody trying to get into that cargo in the middle of the night, Mary and her family, everyone in the town would have been aware of it. And uh, I'm sure they would have been greeted with, um, you know, less than favorably, and that would have been stopped. There were often castaways or uh, stowaways, sorry, stowaways, who would uh, hide on these levee boats and hoping for free passage up to the next town. Uh, and until the steamboat came on the scene, the river was traveled mostly by keel boats, barges, and rafts. And it was brutal and dangerous work. And I'm gonna put in a picture here of um, what some of these boats looked like. So working the river was man-powered and before the steamboat and so many people saw this as an opportunity to make some some quick money or a way, a way to make money and earn a living along the river and the book I read one of the books I read said that almost everybody almost everybody tried it once including Abraham Lincoln Everyone thought they had had to have an experience being a boatman. Now, whether or not they all really did, that's left up to debate. But the people who did this type of work and traveled up and down the river were referred to as voyageurs. They usually wore red shirts, so they could be spotted easily and, and identified as the one, the boatman in charge of the boat and they brought the goods and services along with them. Life on the river was wild. And, you know, I, I, live on, I live on a large body of water, but I don't have that same uh, experience because things in this modern day are so, so different, the way things are done. Um, Now, other boats that came up and down the river brought itinerant workers. And this is where we're gonna get into the Curious Crafter's second question. Uh, these, these people brought goods, and but they also brought services along with them. And so the Curious Crafters asked me, where would Mary have obtained this piece of tin for her tin template? Uh, tin was was available in 1840 and there were tin smiths that rowed on the boats up and down the river and they offered their services repair work creating new products to the townsfolk on the levee at each stop and they were the traveling tin smiths and so Mary's family would have had access to that and very likely could have had a tin template cut. Now there were templates for woodworking, temp templates for quilting designs, all kinds of templates uh, were created along that, at that time. And so that's how Mary got her, her tin template. 
So these, these guys would travel, these itinerant tin sets. So you couldn't just go down to Ace Hardware and access your tin for whatever you needed, your light, your lamp, your repairing, your wagon, whatever it was. You had to wait until the boat arrived with the tinsmith, the itinerant tinsmith on board to, to give you uh, what you needed. Now they crafted and sold and mended tin, tinware. So if you had a broken item and I've, you know, we've all heard about tin cups, tin, tin plates, tin saucers, tin bowls, tin buckets, whatever it was, if you had a problem with your tinware, you had to either repair it yourself or wait till the tinsmith arrived. This was also true unless you had, now St. Louis may have had a tinsmith because St. Louis was larger, a larger settlement and uh, there were people setting up shop and staying put because can you imagine traveling up and down the river? Well, that would have must have been a brutal life. Um, other itinerant merchants included blacksmiths and floating daguerreotype studios. So you could have your portrait taken by daguerreotype by the itinerant photographer who would come floating up river on the boat, take your picture, give you your daguerreotype, and then move on to the next town. There were also tailors and haberdashers who would come. There were fully stocked general stores on some of these boats. They would pull up to the levee, whatever products you didn't have available in your town, were there on this general store. You could go on to the boat, purchase them just like you were walking into a store, and, uh, and then the boat the next day would leave and go to the next levee. The general stores had things just like you would imagine, fabric, nails, newspapers, gazettes. This is where you'd find out all the current happenings, everything that was going on, uh, the state of affairs in the world, and all the gossip. There were also showboats, and they brought actors and musicians and acrobatic troops. Can you imagine that life? I guess it would kind of be like a river cruise. I don't know. Um, doctors came with their medicine shows. There were, all, there were also gambling boats and, of course, brothel boats. So everything for everybody was available on some bo boat coming your way on this Mississippi River. And so you can imagine, as I was reading, I, you know, you can just kind of see the scene where the boat would come into the port and people would start playing music and the boat, they would, uh, you know, leave, the boatmen would leave the boat, meet up with new and old friends, have a good time, get a nice hot meal, uh, they were a rough and tough crowd, these voyagers. They uh, lived pretty wild life. And they were prone to violence, and uh, lots of times the towns were a little bit leery about having them stay a little bit too long. But uh, each barge carried about 40 workers, and for a small town, 40 new rowdy people was going to create quite a stir. So it was always, I'm sure, met with great excitement based on whatever they were bringing and maybe a little bit of trepidation. Uh, so once the merchants on these barges uh, made their money in the town, then they went back on the river and they would start traveling again. It was, it was a life like I don't know that anyone really experiences today maybe if you were uh, working on a carnival cruise ship, it's a little bit like that. So the trip down the river was perilous, just like the trip up. And one in five boats made it successfully without wrecking. That's not very good odds. There were no maps, and if they were floating or traveling at night, Lights in the home and bonfires along the shoreline were their only nighttime guides. So it was, 
laborious to say the least. The waywardness of the Mississippi was a constant threat and weather conditions also affected boat travel. Storms along the river came up and there was perilous fog so thick, as quotes George Morgan in his 1767 diary, at times as to not be able to see the length of the boat. It was challenging at best. Eddies formed, and what those, those are as a, a hollowed out river at the bottom of the floor of the river bed. Sometimes these eddies would extend for two miles, and if a boat got caught in an eddy, it would start spinning, and it could spin for hours before it was released if it was not destroyed first in that spinning process. So this combined with less than perfect boat building practices and inexperienced crew made it kind of a wonder that anyone survived. And then there were the floods. The, the floods, sandbanks caved in, and the sandbanks on the side of the river caved in because the steamboats would park along the side of the river and they would unload and chop down trees to feed the steam engine for the next day's travel. And this depleted the natural barrier to the river and created erosion. Not only that, towns were being built and levees were being established and they would also um, take away from the natural uh, growth along the riverbed. And so there were these, there was this treachery of the erosion of the, of the banks. And this also, the flooding, this combined with the flooding changed the shape of the river constantly. There was no, no map, as I said, because of the ever-changing shape. And so the winter ice from the north would break up and melt, and then it would flood, and the waters would flood the towns. And people would go to bed with the river on the northern side of their home or property and wake up, and it was rerouted to the south. Now, I can't imagine a more alarming thing to wake up to. There were catastrophic floods on the Mississippi between 1809 and 1816. Now Mary and her family definitely would have heard about this, you know, thir that 30 years later. Four of them occurred in 1820 and two in, in 1840. So they would have heard about these past floods and then they likely experienced something of that nature. Part of the reason for the flooding was due to a chain, at this time, was due to a chain of catastrophic earthquakes that happened in the Mississippi Valley from 1811 to 1812. There were 2,000 tremors, and three would have measured over eight on the not yet devised Richter scale. Now, I'm not sure how they determined that, but uh, they were able to go back and, and determine the strength of these earthquakes. I lived in California and have ex experienced a lot of earthquakes. I can't imagine one of that size and nature. And the center of these quakes was a town called New Madrid. And the shock, aftershocks from these quakes was felt in Mexico, Canada, Boston, and New Orleans, and all the way to the Rocky Mountains. A million and a half square miles were affected by these quakes. This was a massive geological shift during this time. The seismic activity and the aftershocks, and if you've experienced an earthquake, you'll know, the tremors lasted for four months. How unnerving was that? Towns were destroyed and an 18 mile long lake was created and the Mississippi at this time temporarily ran backwards. People must have thought the world was ending. It was, it was so unnatural and catastrophic what was happening. Fortunately, the area was not highly populated, so the death toll was not notable. But the area of New Madrid where this happened is still considered an area of great seismic risk. It's one of the areas of great, the greatest seismic risk area east of the Rocky Mountains. 
amazing. I had never heard of it until I was until I'd read these books. I want to I want to close with the story of the River Pirates because I find it really fascinating. The River Pirates were active during this time of this great earthquake activity. One of the great stories on the Mississippi that almost is a legend and could possibly have a little bit of untruth mixed in was the story of the Crow's Nest Pirates and the time of the Great Shakes. So it was called the Great Shakes. The Crow's Nest was a river islet that was small and steep and densely forested and it contained deep caves and it was the base for one of the most feared of the river pirate troops in the 18th century, 18th and 19th centuries. They, uh, they were powerful, they were strong, they, they wreaked havoc all along the river with people traveling with their goods and services. The river in those days was famous for its lawlessness, as I talked about earlier, and they were renowned for their ruthlessly sneaking onto a boat at night drilling holes in the hull, and then waiting until morning when the boat was floundering, they would then make their, their attack. They would kill everybody on board and seize all the goods. They painted false markers on the rocks on the riverbanks that were, that were there for guides for, for these voyagers and other ship captains, leading them astray. Their reign of terror came to an end after the governor of the Louisiana Territory made it illegal for boats and barges to travel unleashed. So remember we talked about these barges going by their, themselves and then they started traveling in groups. Well, then it became illegal to travel alone. So as the story goes, late in 1809, a large group of keelboats and barges had become stranded a few miles upriver of the Crow's Nest hideout. The crew lashed the boat together and over the course of the evening decided to put uh, in, in their boat, decided to park it at the end of the row um, of the crow, near the Crow's Nest Gang. After midnight, more than a hundred voyagers and raftsmen set off in canoes for the islet. The pirates had no watchmen. After all, who would attack them? They were, they were the you know, ones causing all the problems on the river. The boatmen stormed the islet and took the startled pirates captive. There was little loot, according to the story now. You know, it's suspicious because potentially it was taken and hidden somewhere else. But there was a counterfeit printing press for money. And so they, they d destroyed that, as the story goes. Now, this is a story that spread along the Mississippi Valley, and almost every man you met claimed to have been a part of that party. And I'm sure little Mary and her parents were aware of this tale, and whether or not it's true, the pirates sprang up again. And it was not until a century later that the final outcome was discovered in the writings of, of a captain named Captain Sarpy. He had been lured, this Captain Sarpy had been lured into the islet of the crow's nest on the evening of December 15th, the night before the first quake. He quickly realized it was a trap and hid before he was noticed, waiting until morning to make his escape. That night, the first earthquake came and in the dawn light he found the island was gone. The pirates, their loot, their hideout, it had all been overtaken by the flood of the Mississippi River. Life in 1840 was full of these dangers and it was a, a time of new opportunities and new norms and Mary would have been exposed to all of this as a child growing up along the river, doing her stitching, her chart, her, her her um, marking sampler work, all the things that would help her become a person who could function as an adult. Her stitching would have been a part of her life and it would have been constant as she saw all the changes happening around her. I hope you enjoyed listening to this while you were stitching. And for further information about the Mississippi River and two books I highly recommend, 
um, are this one by Jay Feldman, When the Mississippi Ran Backwards. I believe I, it's available on Amazon. And then an older book that you can still access called the Wicked River by Jay Sandlin. All I have is this copy, there's no cover. Lee Sandlin. And I will link both of these below. These were exciting times and stitching was happening and all of this other activity that I just talked about was also going on. I hope you'll let me know your thoughts. If you have other information to share, that if you've done other research and want to share it with the group, I'd love you to do that. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Let me know what else I can add to this story. And uh, please watch my regular floss tubes as I talk about my stitching and show you the projects I'm working on. And then, of course, if you're working on your doll quilt, make sure you're keeping up with the tutorials and share your progress on hashtag first underscore stitches. And until next time, make time for stitching.